Welcome everyone to this week's Mountain West ADC Echo. Really happy to see you all. Tons to talk about today. And I think our speaker today needs no introduction. I think you all know Dr. John Scott, Director of Telehealth here at UW, amongst uh, many, many other roles and responsibilities. John, thanks for doing this. Yeah, yeah. so um, Brian asked me to talk about non-invasive testing for liver fibrosis uh, and liver disease in general. So we're gonna go over that. And I just wanna get you, get you guys ready to Get out your device to vote here because I'm going to start off with a question. Uh, before I do that, just some of my disclosures. I do want to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Maggie Schuhart, who shared her slides on the fibro test that we'll be discussing. She really did a deep dive recently and was, was generous with sh sharing those slides. So our objectives in the next 15, 20 minutes are, are that I, I want you to be familiar with some of the non-invasive tests that are available and, and really be able to list some of the pros and cons. And then a really common situation that comes up is when you have discordant or discrepancies in those fibrosis tests, how do you, how do you resolve that? So I want you guys to get your thinking caps on here. And this is the case. So you're seeing a 45 year old gentleman. He's got well controlled HIV. He's on a integrase inhibitor and a tenofovir and m based regimen. So pretty standard regimen. He's got genotype 1A for hep C, viral loads 800,000. His platelet counts 160. So a little bit on the lowish side is ALT 45, AST 40, and otherwise his liver panel is normal, so albumin, billy, things like that. In terms of his risk factors, no injection drug use. He just uh, MSM when he tested positive for hep C 10 years ago, and that was at the time of his HIV diagnosis. So if you do the calculations on the platelet and the AST, his APRI calculates at 0.625. But a fibrosure shows F4 fibrosis. So kind of a, just to summarize, a low APRI, but a high fibrosure. So what are you gonna do? What would you do next? Would you just take the highest score and really base your treatment decisions and long-term HCC surveillance based on, on the highest score? Would you get a fiber scan? Or if that's not available in your community, get a liver biopsy? Would you get an ultrasound? Or would you go to an EGD? And I, there's no real one right answer. I'll, I'll kind of talk through each of them, but I just kind of want to see what you would do in your clinic. So if you could vote on one of those four options. All right, so it looks like most people would get a fiber scan or a liver biopsy. A couple of people said they would just take the highest score. And one person, it looks like, said ultrasound. So let me just kind of talk through those. In general, I would dissuade you from just taking the highest score just because this is a younger person and if you say he's got f4 i mean he's got potentially 20 30 years of every six month ultrasounds and that's kind of expensive and i really don't think we want to do that from a resource allocation so i guess i would probably say a not what i would choose locally we have fiber scan available uh, and that's what we're going towards uh, to resolve these discrepancies um, but if you didn't have that in your community, liver, liver biopsy would be a reasonable option. The other option that sometimes we would recommend is an ultrasound. You know, if you pick up cirrhosis on that, then that really is helpful. It's not all that sensitive, as we'll go over in the next couple of slides, but it can sometimes pick it up, and, and it's definitive if it's picked up. EGD, I might probably offer as a second or third line test to order just because it's more invasive. But if you had someone who had a platelet count under 150, I definitely would do that um, just because we know that platelet count under 150 is much more uh, correlated with varices and portal hypertension. So let's move on then. So I just wanna go over the overall principles of non-invasive testing. And the first is that the non-invasive tests traditionally have performed really well at the extreme. So F0 or F4. It, once you start getting that F2, F1, F3, right around there, it's not as sensitive and specific. So just be aware of that. Also, I would caution you about using just one non-invasive test. They are best when you can combine them. The best, as I'll go over, is when you can use a fiber scan, kind of a imaging-based regimen with a blood test. And also be aware that some of these blood tests that we're using have limitations. So there's certain medications that might drive up the blood values are part of that, and also other medical conditions like hemolysis. I also want you to not to ignore the whole clinical picture. So when you, if you were to come to our 
Hep C echo, we often ask how long have they been infected? So if someone has been infected for 20 or 30 years and there's a possibility of cirrhosis, that definitely jives with you know, maybe one of our lab results. Otherwise, if they're you know, 25, 30 years old, probably pretty unlikely they have cirrhosis at that point without some really extreme drinking or other injuries to the liver. I also want you to look at synthetic labs, the bilirubin, the albumin. If there's neutropenia or thrombocytopenia, those are often tip-ups, tip-offs for advanced fibrosis, splenomegaly. And then physical exam. Just a quick case I want to share with you is one of our providers on HCV echo what had discordant lab results and said, you know, the liver just feels hard and, and big. And sure enough, we sent them down and they got a fiber scanner and it was F4. So, you know, sometimes our physical exam can really be helpful. And I don't think if we didn't know that physical exam, we would have pushed so hard to get that fiber scan. In terms of the non-invasive tests that I think are the most accurate, fiber scan is probably the most accurate, followed by fiber share and followed by the AST to platelet ratio. And I want to encourage you to look at the raw data when you're looking at either the fiber shore or the fiber scan. So as we start talking about these non-invasive tests, I just want to let you know that a lot of times we're comparing it to the liver biopsy. And that's probably not a really good gold standard. There was a study that was done by Leonard Seif and others almost a decade ago where they were doing laparoscopic surgery and they took liver biopsies from all over the liver at the time of that. And then they found that in 10 to 15 percent, there were a discordant results, just because the, the, the cirrhosis and, and fibrosis is not a, even there. So when you look at your liver biopsy, you want to make sure that there's at least a two centimeter sample with more than 10 portal triad tracts. And if you're working with IR, they should use a 16 gauge cutting needle, not an 18 gauge, otherwise it's too, too narrow. If you ever see a result where there's a bunch of little, little fragments, there's you no know, fracturing, that's often a real good tip off that there's cirrhosis. It was just a really hard liver. So just those things in the liver biopsy report can help you. It is an invasive procedure, can cause bleeding or puncture of viscous, expensive, $2,500. A lot of patients don't like it just because of that, those risks. And it is an art form to interpreting these. So a general pathologist may not look at these that often. So I always, if I have in any kind of doubt, I take it to one or two of my uh, pathology colleagues who look at a lot of these and go over it with them. So what are some of the benefits of the non-invasive tests? Obviously they're easier, they can, they're can they widely available, they tend to be much cheaper, anywhere from 10th to 20th of the cost. They do assess the degree of fibrosis, helps us with staging and long-term care of these patients, and it can also repeat it over time. It's not always recommended to do that, but it is easier to do than a liver biopsy. And there's also some emerging data that these non-invasive tests might predict the ultimate survival and morbidity better than a liver biopsy. So this is a comparison of the, the tests that are frequently used for non-invasive blood tests. The AST to platelet ratio has a kind of a midland sensitivity and specificity in the high to mid 70s. So an APRI over one has, you know, okay accuracy for predicting F3 or F4. If it's over two, I, it's almost a slam dunk that they've got F3 or F4. FIB4 is just like an APRI, but it takes an age, and that has a little bit more specificity with that. And then the fibrosure, or also known as a fibro test, is a widely available test that has excellent negative predictive value, maybe not the greatest positive predictive The paper there that's cited by Castero is really probably the best review if you're interested in, in the topic. So the fibrosure is, is a proprietary algorithm. It was created by some French researchers uh, almost 15 years ago. And the components of it are alpha-2 macroglobulin, GGT, haptoglobin, ALT, bilirubin, and then age and gender. And there are four labs in the United States that are, are approved to run this task. Quest, LabCorp, Mayo, and BioReference. I think locally our lab sends it out to Mayo. And once those labs are run, then it, it goes to a server in France called the, run by a company called BioPredictive, and they vet for any kind of outliers or obvious false positive or false negatives, and then it comes back to you as a report. That's why it takes about a week for the result to come back. And these are just some of the, the conditions that might give you a, a false negative or a false positive result. I'll let you read it, but I wanted to highlight maybe two conditions that are most commonly encountered, and that's hemolysis. So say a patient's maybe taking ribavirin or they have Gilbert's 
that's going to drive up both your haptoglobin and your bilirubin. So that's going to lead to a false interpretation. And then I think we all know that alcohol use drives up the GGT. So that's the most common situation where I, you know, maybe it's just not jiving with the history and the fiber share is really high. I ask them, are they drinking? And sometimes they say, well, maybe. <laughs> and you look, sure enough, you look at the individual components, the GGT is you know, really, really high. So I wanted to let you know there's a lot of medications that can drive up the GGT. I wasn't aware there were so many out there. Um, and some of them are two to five fold. And other things that aren't on this list are NSAIDs, antifungals, antibiotics, and antidepressants. So again, if you're seeing a fiber shirt, that doesn't quite make sense. Take a look at their med list, and that might be the culprit. So just some practical aspects of the fiber test. For a long time, we thought you needed to fast, but if you look at the package insert, they said you don't need to. It's not accurate. With acute, hepati acute hepatitis, hemolysis, extrahepatic cholestasis, or acute inflammation, those first three conditions are going to lead to a false positive. So it's going to give you a result that looks worse than it really is. Acute inflammation will be a false negative. It has been validated in renal transplant patients and it has an acceptable performance in end-stage renal disease. That was also one of those things that we thought we shouldn't use in end-stage renal disease patients, but apparently the package said it's okay. Now, one thing I will ask you to do if you have a fiber shear that you're not so sure about is go back and look at the individual report and ask yourself, is there one lab that seems to be really driving it? Because if there is, then that might be just a, a false positive. So if your haptoglobin is less than 12, that should be a, a red flag. The ALT over 600, which is really, really high. The bilirubin over 1.8 and a normal GGT. And then finally, the alpha-2 macroglobulin over 590. If any one of those is really, really out of range, then you might want to say this is not the most accurate test in this situation. So Thierry Pornard, who is one of the French um, men who developed the FibroShare, published a study looking at the risk for false positive and false negative results. And so they basically said, were there any test results where the fiber test was 0.3 or more um, different? And that would really correlate with a 1.5 histologic fibrosis stage different. And what you see here is that it's about 1% of the time that they see the, the a really discordant result with that low haptoglobin being the most common lab result that is, is driving that. And my experience has actually been more of the alpha-2 macroglobulin, and, and this from this study, it, it isn't. So I just kind of a, a little bit different from what I've been seeing clinically. So next I want to talk about some of the imaging that can be used for patients. Ultrasounds widely available. This is where I'm going to stop and say that not all hep C patients need an ultrasound, okay? I think we way over order it. And the main reason why we're using ultrasounds clinically is for cirrhotic patients and making sure they don't develop HCC. But this should not be part of your standard workup of a patient as part of their fibrosis, just because it's not all that sensitive. So if your radiologist does say that this is definitely a nodule liver, that's a very accurate result. So 80% positive predictive value. And there are other kind of features that they might talk about, like the size of the lymph nodes, um, the patency of the veins, obviously if there's portal hypertension, small volume of studies, those are all going to be congruent with a cirrhotic liver. And just be aware that the high frequency ultrasound transducers are better than low frequency, so it might be something that your local radiologist isn't using. So next I want to talk about FibroScan. This has really revolutionized the workup of hepatitis C in particular. And this is a device that we have available in the liver clinic. This is exactly what it looks like. It's uh, quite thin, you know, really mobile. We can cart it around all over the floor. All of our staff are trained on it. So personally, the person who's best at doing this now is our nurse. She does most of them. And if I can't get it, I ask her to do it. But it takes about five minutes. There's two different probes. We have a, what's called an M probe and an XL or the big boy probe. So those are for people who are a little bit on the heavier side, have a lot of subcutaneous fat. We usually start with the M and then the, the machine actually tells you if you need to use the XL. But you just basically just go on the mid, mid axillary line or across from the xiphoid process and then you want to go in between the ribs and you just have to make it nice and flat and you know, press a little button and it shoots a sound wave and you need to take at least 10 measurements and you get a result pretty quick. So it's basically like doing a virtual biopsy though. It's not like we're doing a full ultrasound. So I had 
someone on Echo asked me if a fiber scan is good for HCC screening. It's not, just because we're just doing this very focused core. And what we're measuring is the stiffness of the liver. So think of the liver as like a sponge. So if it's nice and non-fibrotic, just like a wet sponge, it's gonna soak up that sound wave and it's gonna take a much longer time to come back to you. So in the figure here, this, this readout is a F0. So you can see that the angle of the sound signal is much less steep. And then if you've got a, a hard or a cirrhotic liver, it's kind of like a, a sponge that's dried up and it's gonna really bounce back that sound wave are much quicker. And so the angles of the sound waves are much steeper. The other thing, just from a technical perspective, I'm making sure this is these two lines are parallel. If it's not, that means you're, you're maybe hitting a rib or something like that. This is what the result looks like. You, the raw result is in kilopascals. Like I said before, you need to have 10 results. If we are some reason not in the right place, we can delete some of them. And, uh, but you, you do want to have a, a low variation. So the other thing that gets reported is the IQR, the interquartile range. Ideally, you want it less than 25%. For me, I like to see it less than 10%. Because if it's anything more than that, then there may have been one or two readings that were really out of whack. And I look at each individual one. I want to look at the highest and see the quality of the result, and I want to look at the lowest. So once we get the kilopascal result, we go to this reference range here. And you can see that based on the condition, your, your fibrosis stage varies. So let's take a, a patient with a kilopascal of s 7 if it's NAFLD, they're going to be F2, and if they're, you know, in the HIV Hep C confection, thanks, Kent, they're going to be F0, F1. So please, if you're going to be using this or interpreting it, know that it's been validated in different patient populations, and the raw result is not like a liver bias. It's not going to be the same. And so also, if, if uh, the kilopascal result's right on the border, you know, again, it, it might, if you see a result that's F2, but it's right on that border of F3, that might be a patient I'm still going to do ACC surveillance because it's just so close. So the, the good thing about transient elastography is that you can do a lot more of that. So the study was done that looked at almost 700 patients with a variety of liver conditions. Most of them were hep C, and then they looked at their, their survival. And transient elastography had an ROC curve of 0.87 for predicting morbidity and mortality. So 1.0 is perfect. And so the, I, I think this is, is really quite helpful. And we use it now for who should get EGD. So if mm -hmm. someone has a platelet count of 150 or below and their kilopascals are over 20, then we're using it for EGD. Otherwise, if their platelet counts under 150 but the kilopascals like say 13, 14, then we don't do an EGD. And that's been enshrined in AGA guidelines. So how do these, all these non-invasive tests stack up? This is again from the Castera paper. What you see is FibroScan has the best area under the curve. So, you know, 0.9 to 0.95, depending on what stage you're picking up. Fibro test a little bit lower and APRI is the cheapest, but also the least accurate. But what happens is once you start combining a fibro scan with some of these other tests, then it, it starts to jump up again with FibroSure and fibro tests probably being your, your best combination for all, all across the board. So what are some of the logistics of it? If you're going to use it, the CPT code's 91200. Medicare reimburses about $134 per test. It's mostly in the actual administration. I think the interpretation is like 10 or 15 bucks. We charge $250 here for commercial insurance. I think if, it, if it's a self-pay, it's right around 600 These machines are not cheap. They're about $100,000 if you add Diatosis testing, it's about 125000 and they are now increasingly available in metropolitan areas. We, I know Virginia Mason, Swedish, Harborview, UW has it, and then on the east side, I know that there's a FQHC there, CHAZ, which has it available as well. So, you know, it's good to ask around if there's fiber scan available in your community. So I'll wrap it up here. These are my references and open for any questions.